participant and activism and how scholarship and activism go hand in hand. We have a lot of amazing uh, faculty and students here at Columbia that are not only making a difference um, within academia through their teaching and, and, and a lot of our, our students who are writing on immigration and their scholarship, but also they're doing very important work on the grounds and at a grassroots level. And for those of you who joined us for our previous panel on immigration history, this is a follow up to that. And now we want to highlight the activism aspect of immigration and why it's so important to not only stay up to date with um, immigration policies and um, everything that's going on around us, but also how you all can be a part of it, right? Sometimes we feel overwhelmed and aren't sure how we can make a difference. And so today we are going to hear from uh, specialists and, and scholars on immigration history and how they are making a difference through their classroom, I mean in their classrooms, but also from, you know, activists who are students at Columbia and also doing work on the grounds, as I mentioned. And so we're very excited. Um, thank you again for joining us. And I will turn it over to Emma to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Saida, and thank you all for being here. Uh, we have with us today, Professor Nara Milanich. Uh, she is a professor of history at Barnard College and Columbia University, where she specializes in modern Latin American history with particular interest in the history of family, childhood, reproduction, law and social inequality. And recent years, she has taught a course, Seeking Asylum, History, Politics, and the Search for Justice at the US-Mexico border, and served as a translator at the country's largest ICE detention facility in Dilly, Texas. We also have Yvonne Padilla Rodriguez, is a U.S. history PhD candidate in the history department. She is completing a dissertation on the 20th century history of Latinx child migration to the U.S. Specifically, she addresses the history of undocumented child labor trafficking, the school to deportation pipeline, and immigrant child detention. Outside of the academy, she has conducted research on the migration of children, women, and families for the federal government and nonprofits in the U.S. and Mexico. Ana Barrios is a Guatemalan immigrant currently studying political science and human rights at Columbia University. She is also the co-director and co-founder of Students for Sanctuary, a student group that takes part in the fight towards immigrant justice. Andres Jimenez is the anti-detention and bond fund coordinator for New Sanctuary Coalition. He was born and raised in Brooklyn by his parents who are Paraguayan immigrants and was a first generation college graduate. Deidre Sino is a writer and activist. She met Shakur while he was incarcerated and made a film about a situation called 23 Reasons Why 23, Reason, 23 Years is Enough. You can find the links to, uh, the links to that uh, video on YouTube in the webinar and I'll be posting them shortly on the live streaming uh, platforms. We also have with us today, Meryl Ranzer, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, who is a fashion designer, activist, and campaign and media coordinator at the New Sanctuary Coalition. Thank you all again for being here. We also want to say thank you to our office assistants, Julia and Bethany, who are here today to help. And Julia played a huge part in making this panel today happen. So thank you. And I'm going to just dive into the conversation. Um, Anyway, this is pretty informal, so you all can just jump in when you want to talk. When it, uh, there's some, uh, there's an opportunity to talk. And this first question, though, is uh, more for Professor Milanich or Nara and Yvonne. Uh, what can we expect to change in this shift from the Trump administration to Biden? What will not change, and why is it important to stay mobilized? So maybe I'll just start. Um, and I just want to thank, first of all, Emma and Saida for organizing this um, panel. Um, 
it is an, an exciting moment, um, a promising moment perhaps, um, but one in which we really need to stay informed and mobilized. And so I really appreciate this platform to um, have this conversation and also to have a conversation not just within the history department or with people on campus, but outside of campus and thinking about the ways that we can all um, collaborate um, and think through um, common issues together. Um, so here we are at this moment after the election, sort of, the election that will never end. Um, and I think uh, this question about what's going to change in immigration policy and what's not going to change is one that is very much on people's minds. Um, for me personally, my thinking on this is that in, in the first place that electing Trump out of office was the absolutely necessary, most urgent, critical first step. But it is also entirely insufficient right and extremely partial as an initial step away from this moment where we are right now so on the one hand i think there are many things that we can expect will change quickly um one of the things we learned about um donald trump in the last four years is that he turns out not to actually be a particularly good deal maker after all right so almost all of his immigration um, changes came through executive orders um, and administrative rules um, as opposed to um, legislation and so those things are, are relatively easy to undo um, the muslim ban um, attacks on daca attacks on the asylum system etc um, but I think we also need to be very clear about the limitations of this administration. Um, and we need to realize that the reason that Trump was such, um, and has been, I should, I'm already talking about him in the past tense, has been, is such an effective xenophobe, is because he relied on pre-existing structures and practices and discourses, right? He didn't invent immigration detention. He didn't invent xenophobia. He didn't invent family separation. These are all things that existed before, uh, before Trump uh, was delivered to us. Um, they existed, of course, under Obama, the so-called deporter in chief. So Trump really turbocharged weapons that were handed to him by other people. Um, and we need to be aware of that, right? That when Trump leaves, this is not the end of the story. Um, and in particular, I think we need to be um, very cautious about what Biden brings for us, given that he, of course, was part of the, the administration before Trump, which has been so criticized by um, immigration activists, rightly. Yvonne. Uh, I also really want to thank Emma and Saida for organizing and facilitating this panel. Um, I feel really honored to be a part of it. Um, and I also agree with Nara in that it's really important to have these conversations, not only among scholars, but also um, among people in the public. I think it's important to engage practitioners um, and to bring in also the voices of, of immigrants who um, live with the consequences of immigration policies every single day in ways that um, U.S. citizens don't. Um, I agree with a lot of what Nara said. Um, I think it's extremely important to remain alert and mobilized during the upcoming Biden administration for a number of reasons. Um, I'm going to try to limit them to like what I see as being um, some of the most uh, important uh, policies that we might have to uh, be really vigilant about when they come to children and families in particular, um, not only because they're my particular um, place of expertise, but also because as a historian, um, I've seen how both uh, liberal or democratic uh, administrations have violated the rights of children, have detained children, have separated families um, in in ways that sometimes are actually not all that distinct from some of the um, policies and practices that have been pursued by um, more conservative and Republican administrations. Uh, first of all, I see a lot of clamoring for a return to the status quo. Maybe that's just some of the like particular um, like worlds and conversations that I'm a part of, uh, but I see a lot of Americans who claim that they just they just want to return to normalcy. Um, and while our present circumstances are unbearable in a lot of ways, and I completely sympathize and empathize with that, um, what I often see is missing in the debate is a critical examination of what the Obama era status quo means for immigrant children and families in particular. Um, the Obama-Biden administration is responsible, like Nara mentioned, um, for a historic number of deportations. Um, my, I have uncles myself who were deported during the Obama administration. Um, they're also responsible for the construction of the family detention infrastructure. Again, echoing what Nara said, uh, President Trump um, might be really kind of brazen and for like a white nationalist like him, his rhetoric is 
um, scary and egregious, but he wasn't acting in isolation. He didn't invent um, a lot of these policies. In fact, he was um, using an infrastructure that, that, that he inherited that he didn't invent. Um, I also want to emphasize that deportation is also family separation, which is rarely recognized in, in popular debates over immigration. Um, it's not only the, um, you know, the, the, the deliberate separation of families, which in and of itself is traumatic, egregious, a crime against humanity, um, but deportation, uh, policing in the interior of the nation, that also can be tantamount to family separation. Um, there are, I think, a lot of questions, too, that the incoming Biden administration uh, raises when it comes to the promises that they've made, because they have for the president elect Biden has said that, for example, he's going to restore asylum and the Remain in Mexico program, and that surely will alter a lot of lives. But there are also a lot of questions about whether or not those asylum seekers will be allowed the opportunity to pursue their cases in freedom in the United States. So there are also very specific questions about asylum seeking children and families who might be stuck in these squalid camps on the other side of the border, um, to, to what extent they're um, they're going to be uh, addressed in the incoming administration. There's also a CDC order that has expelled thousands of children um, at the border under the guise of like um, public health concerns. And to my knowledge, there hasn't been a commentary on whether or not uh, that and how exactly that will be addressed. Um, so while some things are bound to change, other things I'm very wary of, um, in part because um, I see uh, the the danger of um, letting our guard down um, in the face of an administration that claims to honor certain humanitarian principles, but has in fact also um, created an infrastructure with which to violate rights. I'm sure others have other thoughts. Um, yeah. One of the follow-up, thank you, Nara and Yvonne. One of the follow-up questions that we had is sort of what both of you um, have, have already answered. But um, it's talking, to, the question is um, just talking about the implications of the different administrations and varying forms of xenophobia that can take, especially with regard to minors. Um, can, uh, does anyone else want to add to that? Um, or Yvonne and Nara, if you guys have anything else you guys want to say, we sort of want to open this question to everyone. I guess um, something more specific would be as Yvonne mentioned that the Trump administration did receive a lot of heat for um, putting children in, you know, cages and deportations, but it was also happening during the Obama administration. Um, how can we as, um, you know, educators, organizers, or even just, you know, everyday people just hold our administration accountable for this and not be blinded by the dual party system and showing alliance to, you know, if you're a Democrat or a Republican, but really seeing like the realities that are happening in between, you know, both parties and con in respect to immigration, um, you know, with, with a Biden administration coming in, like how can we as a people hold them accountable? Um, I, just listening to the discussion, I just wanted to add a thing that um, just today I was doing some research about an enslaved man who was, had been looking for his family after the Civil War. And I was also uh, looking at something else that was about uh, the clearing of Mississippi uh, from the Native nations that were there pushed west across Mississippi. And, and it's, this is a we have a long history of separating children from their parents and separating families and tearing them apart. Um, and, uh, and even more recent with na Native people who uh, had gone through a thing where children were taken and put into certain schools. So I think there's a, a lot of uh, parallels to be drawn uh, in terms of the analysis of what's going on. It's not new for the United States to be doing this. Absolutely. Would anyone else like to add anything? Okay. Hi. I, oh, yeah. oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I was just going to just briefly add we at uh, New Sanctuary are working right now with a family 
um, from Honduras and the, um, it's a mother and her children, one of her children is, is ill. And if they deport the family back to Honduras, he cannot get care there. And we also know what's happening in Honduras right now because of the, um, because of COVID and because of the two hurricanes. And um, she was given a stay of deportation, but we just recently heard that she's been asked to come back um, and check in with a plane ticket um, in December. We have a date. And just, I just want to bring that up because, you know, as, as was said, like family separation continues. It's, you know, um, it's not just happening at the border. And this is, ICE is choosing to do this. This is, they do not have to do this. They want to do this. And we wonder as um, activists and advocates right now, if they are with intention getting crueler for the next two months. You know, so for the next two months, we have to really push harder and then we will continue to push, you know, once Biden takes the office. But these next two months seem quite dangerous. Thanks. Definitely. And as I'm, uh, thank you for that. And uh, we want to learn more about New Sanctuary Coalition. We want to hear about like, what are, how did it start and why did it start? And um, I suppose like as we're seeing things get, like, as you said, crueler. We're also seeing the community come together now more, like more visibly than ever. And uh, I mean, I know that gives me hope, but uh, how can, how can every, er, anyone really anywhere in the country um, get involved in community, I suppose? And that's for Andres or Merrill, or anyone associated with uh, New Sanctuary Coalition. Yeah, so, um, um... I just to uh, piggyback off, off of what everyone said, um, one of our biggest fears, right, with this new coming administration is um, since he's linked, or he, he was working with um, the Obama presidency and that whole attachment with hope, uh, we were afraid of now that the new president, like, coming in um, into office, people will say, well, okay, well, now things are getting back to normal and it won't be as bad, and that's how um, if how ICE became so effective in destroying our community. Um, and it was also so easy for the community to, to um, get, get involved and engage because it was so easy to hate Trump for how he ran as a, what he, what cam how he ran his campaign to become president. And personally, that's how I got involved. I know some other staff members at New Sanctuary now had gotten involved because I'm sorry, because of that. Um, so we're always, um, we always want to continue to engage the students. Like Anna, um, Trisha, they were interns with New Sanctuary Coalition. Um, and it, we're, you know, we're so happy that we were able, they were able to found um, students for Sanctuary and continue to help us. Um, and just to say that, that um, you don't have to have a specific training or us, uh, you don't have to be a, a certain type of way to be an advocate. You know, in in our own personal lives, we're advocates. You know, you listen to the community. For example, if you're a family of immigrants, personally, my parents didn't, they didn't know English, so I had to translate for them. I had to, you know, advocate for them in every circumstance of their life. Whenever we went to the DMV, when we went to the grocery store. Um, so that everyone has an advocate in themselves. It's just a matter of, you know, just um, listening to the people that are around you who are asking for help. Um, and that's what you're able to do with New Sanctuary. You know, now because of COVID, uh, everything is virtual. So we have the Pro State Clinic that's virtual. We have community meeting every Thursday that's virtual. Um, we have the Jericho Walk that's virtual as well. And it's all about just listening to the needs of the community, getting together, creating campaigns like the campaigns that we have for Shakur, who's currently in detention, the campaign that we're creating for um, the other friend that Meryl had mentioned as well. Um, and it's just listening, getting to, together in community, strategizing together with everyone. Everyone plays a part. You know, you have the, the, the professors, you have uh, the PhD candidates who have that that history and that knowledge, and they're, they're able to track patterns. And um, uh, you have advocates like ourselves. You have students that are, are that are able to mobilize on the ground, signing petitions, um, shining the light on um, issues that ICE wants to to put into the darkness. Um, 
um, so yeah, those are just a few ways that you can get involved. A new sanctuary has many programs. We have the accompaniment program, the anti-detention program, the bond fund. Um, we have the pro se clinic. Um, so there are many different ways. I may be missing a few different ways because I'm starting to go on and on, but um, yeah, we're all here. Um, I'm expecting for um, for the fight to get harder now with this new administration. Um, but um, we welcome everyone with open arms. And can I just add that Deidre is here um, to talk about Shakuri's campaign specifically because what we're hoping by the end of this call is that we get everyone who is out there listening enrolled in fighting for Shakuri and and then the other campaign uh, for Maria that I mentioned, we don't have all of that together yet, but um, if you join, you know, if we will add the link or I guess you'll be sending out some information, we can, we can share because it's, that one's pretty, we need, we need, for Maria, we need that fight to happen like yesterday. But um, maybe Deirdre, if, if, I'm, if it's okay for me to ask Deirdre to share about Chikori. Thanks. Um, yeah, I met, uh... Shakori in Otisville Correctional Facility in upstate New York. A friend of mine had asked me to go see a theatrical production he was working on. And uh, all the guys were there performing these wonderful monologues. And after there was a whole discussion, and um, I got up and said how great it was. And Shakori approached me because I had said something about being a writer, and he was a writer. And we started chatting, and um, uh, when I had to leave, uh, he got my address from uh, the guy who I had known, and we started a correspondence, and so we really got to know each other, and it was a long time before I understood why he was there. I just knew he was there for, um, for uh, 25 to life. Um, and we really had a two-person uh, writer's group. Uh, so his family decided that they were going to do this 23 years is enough campaign and try to get clemency from Andrew Cuomo in 2013. And so I went ahead and thought, oh, I'll do a film. I'll put a film together, 23 reasons why 23 years is enough. Um, and uh, thought that I was making a five minute film. Of course, it's not a five minute film because there's a whole lot of good reasons why he shouldn't be, shouldn't have been overcharged and uh, oversentenced. The judge in the case, Edwin Torres, was known as the time machine because he gave people the maximum amount of time he could again and again and again. Um, the felony murder rule was uh, something where if you were involved in a felony and someone dies, anyone dies, even if it's one of the people who are, you know, committing the crime, everybody gets charged with murder. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's a tough question when you find out what somebody is incarcerated for. Um, and I had to think about, you know, my own history and what uh, mistakes I made when I was 18 years old. And I was, a, I always thought I was a great drunk driver back when I was drinking. And that, you know, so I could easily have killed somebody just it so happens that I didn't. Um, so when he, he so the film, uh, we did not win clemency from Cuomo at the time. He doesn't like to, to give clemency to people while they're serving their time. He doesn't like to give it to anybody anytime, but he has been giving it occasionally to people who are, who have served long sentences and then as a kind of a double jeopardy, they're put into the immigration system. Now, Shikori did not, he had very, very, very good reason to believe, and I still believe that he's a U.S. citizen. His father was uh, in the Air Force during the Vietnam War. When he was in basic training, he got sworn in as a, as a citizen. His uh, discharge papers, his DD-214, has a check mark, an X in the box of citizen, um, but they're not recognizing that. Um, Shikori had no idea. Some other people from that particular the crime that uh, Shikori was involved in were deported, but Shikori wasn't. So ICE has already made a decision somewhere along the line that he's a citizen, but now they are hiding that. Um, so uh, 
anyway, that's a, 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 a long answer where now the campaign is to try to get Cuomo to stop this double jeopardy of being incarcerated and being deported to a place he's never been before. And uh, Meryl is going to talk about the whole campaign uh, around that. I'll just jump in before Meryl. Um, thank you, Deidre, for um, explaining the, the criminal um, justice part. Um, he was convicted, um, but, um, you know, at New Sanctuary, we believe no one should be deported. We, um, we, our core values are no judgment, do no harm and respect for all. So um, there's no reason why um, after serving his conviction and um, that he should be punished again. Um, and expelled to a country that he's never been to before. Like she had mentioned before, he was born, Shakur was born in Germany on an American military base and was brought to the US um, at two months old. So he's never been to um, you know, this country where they, they're saying that he's a citizen of Haiti. He's not a Haitian citizen, he's American citizen. This is the, the country that he knows, he loves, he built community with. Um, he created his own nonprofit organization to give back to the, the children that are um, the at-risk youth, something that he was at, at, that, at that age as well. Um, he's, he's gone to school, he's um, gotten his bachelor's, he's, got, he, he's done everything that he possibly can to give back to the world. And now I see that and, and they want to break him and send him to a country where he has no family, he doesn't know the language, he's not, he has nothing. Um, so that's why we're, we're fighting for him more than ever. Um, and um, not to go into too much, but the government is hiding information as well that will prove that he's an American citizen. ICE went um, to pick him up at his house 10 years after um, he had already been released from prison. Um, so, um, uh, so it shows that the government um, knows that he is, he's a citizen, which is why they didn't pick him up after he was released. It, it, usually when you're served a conviction and you're not an American citizen, um, once you're released from prison, they'll transfer you right into ICE custody. So you, you're not released. Um, so this is why we, we built that campaign to push Andrew Cuomo to grant him clemency. That's the quickest way that we'll be able to get Shakur out of detention. Um, but expecting that um, that he might not, but that's what we need. To, we need all you guys that are listening to us right now uh, to get involved, to push Andrew Cuomo, we, to call, um, email, um, tweet, everything that you can to apply pressure so that we can get him, we can bring him home for the holidays. And I'll bring, uh, pass that over to Meryl so she can talk about how to get involved. I, I just want to check in though with the rest of the panel. Is that something you prefer we, I do now or towards the end of the call? Let's do that towards the end so then people will be able to just do it right yep. when, uh, right. And then we'll, then we'll put all the links there too as well. Um, but I do want to turn it to Anna since Anna, you were involved with, or you still are involved with the NSC and you, I believe you co-founded the Students for Sanctuary, is that correct? So tell us about that, uh, why you did that and what you do. Uh, what you do with that group? Um, so it all started because me and one of my close friends, Trisha, um, were just completely horrified at the way that the Trump administration was treating immigrants. And we found ourselves in a difficult position because we wanted to do something. And we were like, well, we're just like 19 year old students. Like, what is there that we can do? We're not lawyers. We don't work in the government. Like, is there anything that can be done? Um, and through researching to try to do something about this, we found the New Century Coalition and started volunteering with them. Um, and we just found the whole like organization to be amazing and loved everything that they were doing and working towards. Um, so we started volunteering and we eventually got in contact with some of uh, the administration at NSC um, and started just kind of trying to gather volunteer interest from our campus. Um, at first, we just kind of wanted to get some more people to find out that NSC existed and to come down with us to their pro se clinic to volunteer. Um, and so we started taking people that were interested to clinics. We then uh, expanded to taking people to accompaniments as well. Um, and 
eventually we ended up gathering a lot of interest. Uh, we now have a lister with around 300 volunteers um, that we mobilize constantly. Um, and yeah, we just ended up turning it into a club. Um, and we now have our own satellite pro se legal clinic that we help NSC with. Um, and we're also, you know, we used to send people to accompaniment. Um, now we have a wonderful network with other universities. Um, we, the latest one is Yale University that are also teaming up with us to volunteer with um, NSC. Um, and I guess we want to get Shakuri. Yes, that's fine. Yes, so Shakuri is actually now on the phone. So Deidre, turning it over to you. Okay, Shakuri, I'm gonna put you up near the speaker. Okay, here we go. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, good evening everyone. Hello. Hey, thank you for being here. Yeah, um, it's my honor to uh, you know be part of this um, session. Um, I didn't get a whole lot of details on the uh, um, aims of uh, the discussion today, um, but nevertheless, uh, I'm here. I'm glad to uh, to make a short appearance because it seems like I may have just only ten minutes. But I'm uh, glad to open uh, any questions that uh, you guys may have. Um, any curiosities or just to listen to some comments. Um, so just let me know how, you, how you'd like to proceed. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, we actually just, uh, we did have a few questions. Uh, we wanted to hear about what your experience with NSC has been and if you feel comfortable sharing um, any part of your story and your journey and what you've been experiencing. Sure. So, um, as um, some of you might know, um, I was um, subject to a, a deportation warrant uh, issued by ICE, um, and uh, on July sixth of this summer, uh, there were eight ICE agents who came to my home and uh, put me under arrest. Um, in complete and traumatic shock to me and my family, uh, and uh, they whisked me away to a um, detention center, quote unquote, which is actually a, a county jail in New Jersey, where I've been, um, where I've been held for the uh, past four and a half months. Thank you. And since the, the aim of this panel is sort of to provide not only the history of like, this is, this is not new, this has been happening for a long time, but also what can the community do? So like in, for, like in your opinion, like what would you want to see the community come together to do not only for you, but like for the, everyone who's experiencing what you've been experiencing? Oh, absolutely. So um, what I think is, is, is the, the real travesty here is where someone who has spent virtually their entire life in the U.S., uh, not um, unlike DACA uh, recipients, um, and because of a, uh, a uh, felony conviction, um, they are pretty much treated as if they had just crossed the border um, and somehow got involved in something that they were charged with. And they're simply put under removal proceedings. So the fact that they could have been here for 20, 30, 40 years, um, you know, raised a family, opened a business, uh, you know, and have been entrenched and rooted in American culture, American economy, um, you know, their communities, means absolutely nothing. So, you know, to, to make it legal, even um, preferable, 
preferable to uproot and excommunicate someone who's virtually an American uh, from this country, particularly to a country that you've never been in, you've never lived in, you've never had any ties with, you have no legal status in. Um, in my estimation, is absurd. And that's exactly what's happening with my case. Um, I, I've never looked at myself as anything but American. Um, and I've tried with, uh, with every opportunity to make a, um, a productive, positive, and inspiring living uh, whether it be with my family or with my colleagues or with my um, team partners, you know, or with my nonprofit, um, you know, that's been that's been my aim. You know, you know, as long as you know anyone who has known the type of work that I do um, can tell you. So it's 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 really mind-boggling that you know the country that we have always known as uh, a country of immigrants can turn around and say someone that has lived their entire lives here, uh, you know, except for a technical legal classification and turn around and say, oh, well, uh, you're no longer wanted here. So um, we're detaining you pending your deportation. Thank you so much for joining us today and answering our questions. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Nara. Yeah, it's, and, I, yeah, he only has a few minutes to talk. Oh. So, um, and then he has to go. So maybe if uh, anyone on the panel wanted to ask anything, like maybe like if NSC, like what is your, like what do you do? Uh, and what do you do to help? And what is your relationship with each other, I guess? I mean, just because Shakori does have a short time, I would like to ask him to share what it's like right now in immigration detention. You know, yes. he's there during COVID, and I think it's important for people to understand what that means. Yes, thank you. Sure, sure. Um, I'd, I'd be glad to um, give some insight into that. Okay, so uh, I think people have, um, uh, a misnomer with the term detention. Um, I know, I know that the administration and uh, ICE and DHS use the term detention to signify, you know, what type of confinement or um, uh, how the person is being held, and it should be something different from being incarcerated in a prison or a jail when there's absolutely no difference. I am in a county jail, just as those who are uh, picked up by the police, uh, charged, arraigned, indicted, and a court, you know, um, either gives them or does not give them bail. So, you know, it's, it's the same exact environment. It's just that right at this particular jail, um, I'm in what they call an ICE unit. Uh, but the, the units are identical. They're all cells, concrete and steel. Um, you know, you have uh, limited recreation in a day room or recreation room that's just um, uh, outfitted with tables and chairs, a, uh, TV, and um, that's it besides the uh, phones that we have access to from time to time. Um, and that's that's pretty much your your existence, you know. It's um, so it's it's not any different from what you would understand from the uh, criminal justice system in terms of um, uh, being held. So, like I was saying in, the other day in, a, in another conference, I wear an orange jumpsuit that says Bergen County Prisoner," and um, that's pretty much how I can describe what the, uh, the environment and situation is. 
We really appreciate your time, Shakuri, and thank you for sharing some very vital insight with us, and we look forward to continuing to hear from you. Oh, absolutely. I'm uh, honored to... And we'll, share links, uh, and we'll share links to the campaign and your video as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. And for the sake of time, I am going to turn it over now to uh, Nara. I have a few questions here that we've been getting from uh, the social, uh, some social media questions as well. Um, what can history, a historical perspective, contribute to our understanding of present day challenges to immigration rights? Are historical arguments ever in tension with legal arguments? Thank you. Yeah, so this is a, you know, a policy or policy, a panel from the history department. So like, what is the relationship then between history on the one hand and um, what we're hearing Shakure talk about, um, you know, and his experiences at this moment and, and, and all of these, you know, critical policy issues that we've been talking about. And I think very often people study history and they don't, uh, they, they're not, it's not well taught in a lot of schools. Um, so we think that history is a bunch of facts of things that happened in the past, right? Um, and it ha somehow has nothing to do with what's happening in the present. Um, but I think that for me, the power of history is to denaturalize the present, which is to say that history helps us um, see that things that we take for granted haven't always been that way. Right. Um, and when I say things that we take for granted, I mean structures and institutions and ways of thinking. Right. Um, things that are second nature to us um, don't, uh, you know, haven't always existed the way that they exist now. Right. Um, and I think, you know, you can you can do no better than to to speak about, you know, the immigration uh, enforcement structure to appreciate that point. So, you know, ICE, which we think of, or DHS, which we think of as these gargantuan, abstract, omnipotent, you know, implacable institutions, right? Um, how can we ever change them? And then we look at, you know, we don't have to go very far back in time to see, oh my God, they're actually really new. Um, immigration enforcement has been done in different ways um, over the course of the 20th century. Turns out ICE is, you know, founded in 2003. That's like younger than probably um, students on this call. So, you know, ICE is like a little annoying 17 year old brother, right? Um, so if we think about it in those terms, suddenly structures that seem implacable and immovable become less powerful. And so I think that that's one of the things um, that history helps us to do. It helps us also to think about not just institutions, but ways of thinking, right? Um, the, very, the very distinction between legal and illegal immigration, which this, um, which this, this administration has made, you know, such, uh, has so emphasized. Um, as our, our colleague, um, Professor May Nye tells us, you know, that's a, that's a relatively recent invention, right? Um, so I think these are some of the ways that history helps us to understand the present. Um, is history in, ever in tension with legal arguments? Um, I think sometimes they, it is, it can be. Um, historians, myself included, love to argue that there is nothing new under the sun. Right, that um, and I have made you know the argument about family separation that this policy looks a hell of a lot like analogous um, you know historical episodes of Native American child removal and other other things. That's an, that's absolutely an argument I buy and have made myself. Um, I do wonder sometimes if historians, in making that argument, unwittingly um, can naturalize certain policies and make them sound like, well, it's not that bad, or um, it's happened in the past, right, and therefore somehow it becomes not so bad if it's happening in the present. So I worry sometimes that that might be an unintended um, outcome of our, our arguments that there's nothing new under the sun. Um, so for example, I've seen, you know, the ACLU when it, uh, uh, when they make their arguments about family separation um, in court, um, you know, one of the things they really like to drive home is that this is unprecedented. This is absolutely the worst policy that they've seen in 30 years of, you know, practice. And that's a really powerful argument in the court to make, right? But it's one that's sort of in tension, I think, with um, the arguments that historians want to make where we find, you know, roots and um, um, and resonances moving back in time. So, so there might be a tension there too. You commented on, um, you know, talking about history and, and teaching. There's a course that you teach called Seeking Asylum, uh, in which students combine academic study of asylum issues with hands-on engagement with social justice and advocacy organizations. And I think that's really the, the heart of our panel today. Can you, um, 
just describe what that course looks like and also give us some concrete ideas for how to get involved in immigrant rights issues, like how you do that through academia. Yeah, so I think that all of us are coming to this panel with the same message, which is that there are lots of different ways to get involved in these um, issues and that we have to, you just sort of have to think about what your own um, interests or passions or skill sets are, where are you in the world and how can you, what, how can you do your part? Um, and so for me, I, um, after and I, and Andres um, um, and somebody, I think Anna also made the, the comment um, that, you know, 2016 and the, um, in the election of Trump was a really radicalizing experience for them. And I, I had the same experience myself. Um, and for me, that moment was consisted of students coming to me and saying, what can I do? I want to do something. Uh, what do I do? I'm I'm 19. I'm 18. Uh, how, how, uh, give me something to do. Um, and so, in the first instance, I gave them lists of organizations in New York City. Um, among them, NSC. Go volunteer. Um, go offer your services. Um, but the fact is that most um, immigrant rights organizations are incredibly strapped for time. They do not have the bandwidth to deal with young, energetic, but unskilled labor, right? Actually, NSC is probably the organization that does this the best, like they have a structure for doing this, but most organizations don't. Um, and so it felt a little irresponsible to just sort of send students out willy nilly into the city to go help. Like, what does that look like? What does that mean? Do you actually know what you're doing? Do you know anything about these topics? Um, and so it was really that experience that inspired me to teach this class called Seeking Asylum, where we talk about the history and politics of, of the uh, so-called asylum crisis um, on the US-Mexico border. Um, and the class is distinguished by the fact that we partner with um, an advocacy or activist organization. Um, and so that students are learning about these issues, but we're really putting, um, the, figuring out how to put their knowledge and, and new skills to work for the organization, our partner organization. So it's really the partner organization that calls the shots and tells us what they need and how we can help them. Um, so uh, the first year I taught the course, we went down to um, the largest ICE detention facility um, in the country um, in Dilly, Texas, and the students worked for a week um, as part of a pro bono legal project there. Um, this past year, we collaborated with Kids in Need of Defense, which is an organization that works with unaccompanied minor migrants. Um, and this coming semester, we'll work with Women's Refugee Commission on a storytelling project. Um, so, you know, the idea again is to sort of think about the relationship between academia and activism and to think about the relationship of the classroom to the real world. And we often talk about those things as if they're binary and, and sort of, well, there's the classroom and then there's the real world or there's the Ivy Tower and then there's, you know, what real people are doing. And I, I really want to bring those things together and, and kind of deconstruct that um, that way of thinking about uh, the relationship, but to think how they can be, you know, sort of mutually uh, nourishing one another, you might say. So that's really the, the, the purpose of my class. And if there are any students on uh, who are interested in the class next semester, I'll put my uh, email in the chat momentarily, because um, I'd love to have you. Thank you. I, have, I just have a follow up question. I'm curious, Nara. When you when you did that, was that something that, you know, I, I think it's very different in academia. Did you receive any backlash or how was it accepted or was it accepted? Was it not accepted? Because oftentimes, you know, as a student myself, you know, you go to class and you learn, but then you sort of come home and you're like, I have all this information and I feel like frustrated. What can I do to help? But you're not only teaching, but you're also, you know, tying in activism hand in hand. And how, how has that experience been for you as a professor? Yeah, I mean, so isn't this, you know, and I've had people ask me, wait, is this like blurring the line between activism and teaching? And, you know, universities are, are you know, uh, supposed to be nonpartisan spaces. Um, and my feeling about this is that I am not telling students what to think. I am putting at their disposal information and experiences, and then they decide how they're going to think about those things, right? These things are happening in the world. These organizations are um, existing. They, these processes are happening, and I'm putting them at you. I'm, I'm trying to make them available so that you can see what is going on. 
um, and I'm trying to put information at your, you know, at your disposal um, and um, and have you read things in a world where, you know, we never know if what we're reading is is re for real or not, right? Um, but I'm not telling people what to think. They can have their own you know, opinions. There is no party line in this class. And people have different, um, you know, sometimes different opinions about, um, about you know, different aspects of immigration policy, and that's, that's fine. Um, so it's not my duty to tell people what to think. It is my duty to um, put knowledge or information at their disposal and to encourage them to learn how to think critically about their world, which is, of course, what is so frustratingly missing sometimes from our, our, our public conversations in this country. Absolutely. And something that I, uh, my friends in grad school and I used to always talk about was that, you know, as, as students who are studying history, you know, we read about all of these atrocities and, and stories. But I think with you, uh, not only teaching history, but also allowing your students that space to see it and experience it for themselves, kind of makes it more real, right? And it and, and it, it makes it more human. So I really appreciate that. I wanna turn it over to Emma and- yeah. um, So uh, on that through line, of, we've been talking a bit about family separation and how that looks like many different things uh, throughout time. And Yvonne has written a lot of uh, work about it. So I want to ask her, uh, like, like so much of immigration history as conceived as adult centric, and a lot of this abuse seems to be hidden or erased or hard to find, perhaps is the better uh, <laughs> way to put it. Um, could you please like uh, just speak about how America has been turning away or just treating children, maybe specifically who are seeking asylum? Sure, um, thanks for that question. Um, I think it's true that a lot of scholarly work about immigration in particular is overwhelmingly adult centric and yet there have been millions of children who have immigrated to the US for more than a century from diverse countries of origin in Europe, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean. So contemporary surges of migrant minors are part of a much longer history of child migration to the US. Um, kids have certainly arrived um, as asylum seekers, as migrants, although if you have read, you know, any literature in critical refugee studies, you also know that the lines separating those categories are very, very blurry um, because, you know, young people, also adults who might be fleeing things like um, poverty, for example, that in and of itself is a structural form of violence, um, and yet uh, those people are depicted as not being um, uh, deserving of protections under humanitarian asylum or refugee policies. Um, so I actually, um, I have an overview of child migrants um, in the 20th century that is supposed to come out next month with the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of American History. So if anybody wants a broad overview, once um, it's out, I can certainly share it. Um, but in it, I write a lot about um, European and Asian child migrants in the first half of the 20th century who um, arrived um, at at inspection stations in the New York Harbor and the San Francisco Bay. Um, even though some accompanied and unaccompanied European child migrants experienced detention and even family separation at Ellis Island, most were processed and admitted into the US fairly quickly in the early 20th century. Um, those children that were removed from the nation were removed for allegedly having immigrated for an immoral purpose, for having suffered from an illness or a disability, or being unaccompanied, um, because those were grounds for deportation under the Immigration Acts of 1907 and 1917. Um, Chinese and Japanese child migrants were more frequently subjected to family separation, abuse, detention, deportation at Angel Island. Um, they were, particularly when it came to Chinese children, they were accused of um, presenting fraudulent claims to entry, which is not all that um, different from some of the accusations that are made against unaccompanied minors from Central America today, um, that they also are presenting fraudulent claims for entry. Um, some of these children um, were detained for weeks in detention, um, deported, separated from families. Um, there's even evidence that some Chinese children um, in the first half of the 20th century in detention actually died from the life-threatening conditions that detention um, subjected them to. 
Um, I'm sure that some people in the audience might also know about Mexican children um, during the Great Depression repatriation drives that were removed or coerced into voluntary departure alongside millions of adults. Um, some of these people were US citizens, some were undocumented. Around um, mid-century, European, Cuban, and Indo-Chinese refugee children were admitted into the U.S. through a series of ad hoc programs and temporary legislation until the 1980 Refugee Act created a permanent mechanism for the admission of refugee and unaccompanied children. Um, but anti-Semitism shaped the early admission of child refugees that were trying to flee Nazi Germany, for example. Um, in 1939, Congress failed to enact a law that would have set aside visas for German Jewish children. Um, and in 1940, and this sort of illustrates how um, racial and religious preferences can sometimes play a role in refugee admission politics, even when it comes to children. Um, there were a series of air attacks on Great Britain and the US supported efforts to admit over a thousand British children um, uh, from into the U.S. Um, exclusionary immigration laws, the hardening of U.S. international boundaries, and the U.S. preference for refugees who fled communist regimes like those in Cuba or Indochina during the Cold War made unlawful entry the only option for thousands of accompanied and unaccompanied Mexican, Central American, Haitian children in the second half of the 20th century. Um, many of these children were also subjected to detention and deportation in the late 20th century. Um, and it's in the 1970s that the U.S. starts to systematically detain um, migrant minors, um, particularly unaccompanied minors. Um, this happens in the post-1965 wave of unauthorized immigration from Mexico during the period where asylum seekers in Central America were fleeing state violence, child conscription in U.S.-backed civil wars, um, and a period in which there are large waves of refugees also from the Caribbean. Um, it's also in this period that in my own research, I write about a moment of family separation um, that is, I think, the, perhaps the most analogous to the one that happened in 2017 and 2018 um, with the zero tolerance policy in that uh, um, immigration authorities separated families while they were trying to prosecute the human smugglers um, who transported them across the border. And in doing that, the human smugglers were really well resourced and they could pay for bond really quickly. But this actually resulted in the mass detention of thousands of children um, and often their detention involved physical separation from their families inside detention centers that were not equipped to house children. Um, children were often lost to the federal bureaucracy. They were sent into foster care um, through a program that the U.S. Marshals had contracted. Um, children were also deported alone into Mexico, where often they were uh, recriminalized and put into juvenile detention facilities there. Um, there were advocates at the time who claimed that uh, family separation for some of these families was permanent, that children were, were permanently lost to their families. Um, and the federal government was insistently um, lying and saying that they weren't separating families. Often they would contradict themselves and say that um, they weren't separating any children under 10, which of course indirectly confirmed the separation of older children. Um, and yet there were human rights defenders, there were um, migrants inside detention centers who had organized hunger strikes and journalists who were calling attention to the fact that infants, newborns were being detained, um, children were in fact being separated and lost. Um, so just to speak to a lot of the themes that have been spoken on here, it's extremely important to listen to advocates, especially when government testimonies are unreliable, sometimes they're extremely deceptive, um, and that family separation, whether it be through deportation, whether it be in the history of um, uh, violence against indigenous families or uh, black enslavement, family separation is something that has happened in the past. It's happened to immigrant families and the government has um, engaged in a lot of erasure. Um, so it's like a, a broad overview, but I can certainly answer questions about any of the particularities or waves of immigrants. I actually had a follow-up question about erasure, so it's perfect timing. Um, why is it so hard to find proof of abuse? For instance, we heard about the forced hysterectomies that were happening at an ICE detention center, um, but oftentimes we hear about things in the media and, you know, people are reposting and it's, it's, a, it's a hot topic, but then it sort of fizzles out and then it's hard to find any information about it. Um, so can you talk about 
um, you know, a pattern of abuse reported, patterns of erasure, um, hurried deportation of survivors, destroying files, you know, and again, I mentioned the, the forced hysterectomies that we heard about recently, but um, we don't really hear much about it afterwards. So can you speak on that a little bit, Yvonne, and then um, Nara, and if anyone else would like to add to that? But Yvonne, if you could answer first, please. That is a really great question, and I'm sure that others will have some thoughts, so I'll, I'll try to just um, give a few points, which is that um, when I talked about, for example, the immigration of Haitians to South Florida, um, there were Haitian children, for example, who protested the abuse that they experienced while being incarcerated, the excessive disciplinary measures, the abuse, other rights deprivations to which they were subjected. Um, they staged prayer demonstrations, hunger strikes, um, and one of the ways that the government retaliated against them was by subjecting them to deportation. Um, in my own research on Mexican children who were expelled from schools in the 1970s and 80s, when they brought lawsuits against those practices. Um, the federal government in those cases tried to initiate immigration raids in their communities to intimidate the kids and their families from bringing um, lawsuits um, that would expose systematic rights violations. Um, I also have research about kids who were labor trafficked and they too were retaliated against when um, they tried to bring um, lawsuits about their labor exploitation, about their debt peonage. Um, so there is a history of deporting undocumented immigrants, even children, um, who speak out against right, rights violations. Um, I think one of the reasons why it's so difficult um, to document, to expose patterns of abuse um, is historical. Um, it's a result of mounting legal challenges that were waged against the immigration system um, that made it so that by 1924, immigration law had begun to diverge from constitutional norms and the Bureau of Immigration had emerged as a really powerful organization that was free from the constraints that were imposed on other government agencies. Um, so it was a lot of persistent litigation that contributed to the development of legal doctrines that gave the immigration, that gave immigration authorities a lot of power to um, fight against resistance from immigrants. Um, one final reason that I'll add is just simply that in the case of incarcerated immigrants, immigrant detention centers can be so remote, they can be so geographically disparate, they can be so far from each other. Um, and they also engage in the practice of habitually transferring um, ICE detainees who already have limited rights, like not being guaranteed an attorney. Um, and I think that that remoteness, um, that hiddenness of a lot of detention centers also facilitates a culture of impunity. It also enables um, a continued erasure. Yes, definitely. Thank you. And for uh, we, we, I know we all can talk about this for so long. Um, we were going to continue, but I just want to request that we keep it to about a minute each person because we, we've never had a panel with this many people on it before. And we are, we, we really want to make sure we keep it balanced, um, uh, especially between like academia and uh, activism. Like uh, Nara was saying, it's uh, an interesting relationship. So we want to make sure that we keep it in conversation with each other. Um, but if anyone else can speak to that. Yeah, Meryl. Well, I just wanted to share because I get alerts, something that just came on my phone that really talks to what's happening like in this conversation um, from AP, children detained at border facing COVID exposure. This is from 18 minutes ago. Um, there's 65 immigrant children at, in South Texas, rural area that you were just like, were, you know, referring to Yvonne. We know that children have been flown across the country during COVID. So, this particular place where they are, there's, there's, no, there's lack of soap, hand sanitizer, no social distancing, we're very limited. Um, and they've been there for three days and you know we're just hearing about it. So there's more uh, to the story, but I thought like, holy crap, excuse me, but <laughs> here we are talking about like, as, as you were speaking, this flashed on my screen and this is the kind of thing that's happening to children that you know, sometimes it makes it's a blip on the radar because people are overwhelmed with so many other things. Yes. Um, we also encourage uh, if you have questions for the panelists, if you're on the live streams, comment your questions uh, in direct. Uh, let's keep it uh, more organized so it, uh, you can direct it to a specific professor or student or activist. Um, so Anna, actually, we haven't heard from you in a bit. So I want to um, give you some more time. Can you talk about the court process? Maybe that seems to be an area where 
that there is conversation, but maybe not on the news all the time about what that process is for people and maybe how you as a student and activist have gotten involved in that. Yeah, so I feel like one of the things that you realize once you start working with people that are in court proceedings is just how dehumanizing the entire process is. Um, and that is something that you don't really think of as much when you haven't seen it firsthand. Um, I feel like a lot of the process, both through like EOIR, which is the court system, and USCIS, is just designed to completely bring down the person and just, you know, both through like cross-examination and like trying to say that like their stories are false and through like things like ISAP, which, you know, put the ankle monitors on them and just the whole system's assigned to just completely dehumanize every single person that comes into it. And it's very heartbreaking um, to look at, um, especially in the case of children, you know, like uh, through NSE, I've worked with a lot of children that came in unaccompanied. I've worked with children that were separated at the border from their parents. And it's just, it's very sad to see the ways in which all of this has affected them because you realize as an adult that this is probably gonna have long-term consequences. It's not just about being in a detention center and then coming out and everything's fine. These are things that are gonna keep, um, you know, just affecting our communities for a long time, um, which is why I think it's very important that people are constantly getting involved, not only to see this and attest to the things that are happening, but you know, just kind of like, how do the places that we inhabit also contribute to this? Like, look at what the companies that you are purchasing from are supporting. Look at what contracts your university has. One thing that we did as students here at Columbia was mobilize against the contract that Columbia had with CDP, um, where they were benefiting from detention. I think the contract was $150,000. Um, and as students, you know, many students groups uh, mobilized against this and we got them to cancel the contract, which was amazing. Um, but these are some of the things that like you can do through just like, I don't know, getting involved and just realizing that even though this all seems like it's so distant and like legal jargon and that you're not supposed to show up or see this, like just going on accompaniments helps people a lot to not feel scared and like feel like somebody's witnessing the injustices that are being done to them and like being able to spread the word. And so that it's not just falling into the ears of the people that want to hear immigrants directly but also you know it like permeates into like family conversations and just things like that which I think is very important. Thank you. We, uh, unless Deidre you wanted to say a uh, quick something. I just want to say quickly that also I think there if there's law students listening going into immigration law is one of those things that maybe people don't think of but I was talking to somebody uh, who was very glad that he was in there because he was understanding how kind of illegitimate the uh, the immigration courts are because they're not under the judicial branch of the U.S. government, the three allegedly equal branches. They're under the executive branch, which means that they cannot be uh, just independent and more. <laughs> we need more fight right from the very roots of this horrible system. And we had a question for Nara. Um, what is the, someone submitted on YouTube Live, what is the role of immigration historians in the immigrant rights struggle? That's a really great question. Um, and I'm actually not a historian of immigration. Um, Yvonne is our historian of immigration on this um, panel, so I'd be interested to hear what she has to say. Um, I actually want to flip the question and think about um, not just what historians can do for immigrant rights, but what immigrant rights can do for um, folks sitting in, in, in a university. And I want to give as one example, I mean, this is a small but critical thing. Um, what Anna said about the contract from CBP, um, that we learned of that contract because a, a student um, in the organization, Students for Sanctuary, was chatting with someone at NSC who showed him how to look up grants on the federal registry of grants, whatever the web page is. And it was there that they discovered this grant that we did not know that we, I, I don't think anybody, well, I'm sure some people at the university knew, but no one who was gonna make us think about it knew until that moment. So there's a moment when and somebody at NSC um, showed this student how to look this information up on the federal registry and all of a sudden we had you know, a, a major scandal on our hands of discovering that there was this contract. So I think that this, 
this teaching and learning goes both ways, right? Um, certainly, um, you know, academics have, um, you know, and I don't want to denigrate expertise because we're in a moment where, you know, no, you know, where we have a political climate that denigrates expertise. So I don't, I don't want to do that. I want, I, I want to own our expertise, but I also want to suggest that it goes both ways. And that's an example of where, um, you know, thanks to NSC and thanks to Students for Sanctuary, um, you know, we were able to identify, they were able to identify um, the contract and then um, people could mobilize around it. And the, as a result, the, the university is a better place. We no longer have, you know, a, a contract with Customs and Border Protection. Yeah, uh, did, Yvonne, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, sure, I'll just add briefly that I think um, a lot of the, a lot of what has been said, I think kind of answers the question a little bit indirectly that historians can offer the immigrants' rights movement um, a perspective Perspective about longevity. Um, Nara mentioned earlier, I think really eloquently, um, and I hadn't th thought about it in this terms, that of history helps to denaturalize the president that can produce really um, powerful arguments that might be able um, to be actualized by people on the ground who are doing the grassroots advocacy. Um, I saw like, I think maybe some weeks ago that there was conversation around um, CBP trying to destroy some of their documents um, that would have documented some um, abuse probably. Um, and I think that by investing in the work of immigration history, that also can essentially help explain why destroying documents is just simply not a good idea um, and can and can help to further, um, if those documents were destroyed, I mean, we'll, we won't know um, what kind of like abuse and rights violations have been perpetrated. Uh, but I also agree that it's, it's, um, it's an opportunity or rather that we can learn from each other that it's not just like historians and academics that um, can offer something to the immigrants rights movement. I think the immigrants rights movement and grassroots organizers and immigrants themselves um, have a lot of insight to offer us um, as well. Thank you. I'll say it in a few. Wanted to. Well, yeah, thank you. That That's actually a perfect uh, setup for my following question. I, I, my first question is, what can people do to become more active and help make a difference? And I know that's a very general question, but Yvonne, you mentioned something about hearing from real people who have actually experiences and are experiencing the ramifications of immigration laws, right? And, and the separation of families. Um, I like to look at it as how can people view this as you know a humanistic approach oftentimes we hear about um, so many stories through social media as we're scrolling on our phones and it sort of desensitizes us right so i guess i have two questions for all of our panelists is how can people get more involved and make a difference and how can we take a more humanistic approach to the atrocities that are occurring Whoever wants to go first. Oh, go ahead, Anna. You can go first. <laughs> no, 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 you can go. You can go. Um, I'll be really brief. Um, I think personally, um, I mean, I can speak about getting involved with New Sanctuary, but um, on outside of New Sanctuary, um, personally, I have corrected friends on the language that they use. For example, illegal uh, is something that really irks me when I hear because nobody's illegal. So I always correct people in, in correct, um, instead of saying illegal and documented. Um, and then having that conversation, it's a tough conversation um, with your friends and your family members, especially coming from a Hispanic home. Um, uh, watching Univision and Telemundo is not always the, the right, they, want, they won't get the right information. So um, correcting family members and friends um, is definitely one way to bring a human uh, a human approach to that. Um, and then I'll bring a new sanctuary as getting involved um, with the anti-detention team. I get phone calls from detention every day. So just hearing someone on the other line, um, you, you feel the anxiety, the pressure, uh, the depression that they're falling into. Um, and it make and uh, it makes you want to uh, do as much as you can. Um, and we don't always win, you know. But um, knowing that we're giving someone that that power to tell us their uh, their story, 
um, gives them power and it gives the community um, power to advocate for themselves. Anna spoke about accompaniments, them not going alone. Um, so empowering the community so that they're not depending on us, but they have the power to advocate for themselves. So I think that's what, um, to be short, that's what I would definitely bring up. And Anna, before you, uh, if you had anything to add to that, there was someone who asked, uh, how can, like, can we help at the local level and how? And I think that's a great question because it can sometimes feel lofty when someone just says, get involved. And it's like, yeah. where do I start? <laughs> Um, so yeah, a way that, um, the way I started was really just finding an organization that was willing to take in volunteers. And then there's a lot of initiative you can take from there. Like for me, Anuja and Trisha, it meant creating a club to get other people mobilized, to get out there. But I think it also means bracing awareness, you know, um, if you have, if you know lawyers or if you're a lawyer doing like uh, know your rights trainings or just spreading information like this, you know, going with pamphlets of know your rights and going to businesses and being like, hey, can we put this here? Like just raising awareness of things is very important in the local level. And if you don't find like a, like a structure or institutions that are already doing this work, um, you know, you can get involved and you can create some of this work, always informed by the people that you know, this is affecting, by the way. Um, I think that's very important um, to first and foremost, like put the people that are being affected at the forefront of any movement or any type of involvement that you're gonna be getting to. Um, and then just moving on to like the humanization. I think something that's very important and that I see often in social media um, is the sharing of images that are very disturbing and personal and dehumanizing in turn that people share just to like take part in the sensationalism, like. It happened with that father and his daughter that were crossing the river as well as like the death of some of the children in detention and I think you know it is so important for me to always emphasize how wrong that is and how much people shouldn't be sharing those images and just respect the privacy of these people not as a sensational moment or a controversial point in time but as people and to respect that as well yeah, and I think uh, if there are any uh, his, historian people here who want to talk about maybe like before we wrap up like humanization in history and maybe if like I don't know if that's something that you've encountered uh, in your work as you were studying and uh, when you're a student like do you encounter work that you find really jarringly dehumanizing and uh, and on the opposite end of that how do you humanize history in your own work? Maybe I would just say, um, I'm not sure if this is an answer to the question, but um, it seems to me there are multiple ways that people can get involved, you know, and this is sort of going back to the question of how do you get involved, like, you know, if you're not a lawyer, you go, well, what can, what can I do? The, everything seems to happen in the courts, right? But in addition to the courts, there's also the court of public opinion. Right. Um, and so um, a number of the comments <clears throat> of Andres and Anna and others have made reference, I think, to the, the power of stories. Um, and so I would like to make a plug for um, the importance of narratives and stories. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons we're in the moment we're in is that there are such odious and noxious stories and narratives circulating about migrants and immigrants. Um, and but they're not omnipotent. I mean, they can be replaced by something else. And so, um, you know, I train my students in op-ed writing so that they can go into public and say something, you know, learn something and then say it, right? Um, and say their narrative so that it's floating around, around there. But I don't think you need to write an op-ed to do that. I mean, I think probably there are brilliant 15-year-olds who with a TikTok uh, video meme can, uh, you know, um, can change the way people think about things. So I want to make a plug for people um, thinking about the power of narrative and storytelling and the stories that we tell um, and certainly um, uh, people working, for example, N at NSC with friends of, in, in the organization, um, you know, hear stories and that's not to say they should go out and tell other people's stories, but I think that there are ethical um, and effective ways um, that in respectful ways that you can um, 
share, you can witness what you are seeing, right? Um, as opposed to simply just sharing someone else's story, but you can share your story, right? Your experience of working um, with the with the friends um, or, you know, what you witnessed about how ICE functions or whatever. And I think those are really, really important. It's, it's actually kind of amazing how little people know about what goes on in immigrant detention centers and in immigration courts, et cetera. There's a lot of stuff to know about the world. So it's not anybody's fault, but I think that for people who might be interested in this, it's it's really um, incumbent on us to try and um, bring those stories out. Um, and so I think it's, you know, I mean, we got to hear Shakuri um, on this call, like, that's kind of amazing. Now, you know, somebody can go write a letter to their, uh, to the editor of their local paper and say, you know, people in immigrant detention wear orange, you know, jumpsuits. Um, and, you know, here's what they're experiencing. Um, you know, so just one small example, but I, a plug for stories. Yes, and I think that's a wonderful place to wrap up. Um, and uh, I really, I, I, I feel um, like we, I, you can check in the comments actually, there are some action items. Uh, yeah, if Meryl wanted to, oh right, Meryl, yes. Yeah, just because this is so important, so I'm just gonna be a nudge and, and <laughs> say this. <laughs> um, because, you know, people are asking, I got something super specific, they should do it the minute they get off this phone call, you know, and it's really easy. Is it, can I share my screen for like two minutes? Yeah, I think you is have that capability. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you all what, um, oh my God, my screen oh, is so full. And for those who might not know the, the phrase action item, that really is just sending an email to a representative or uh, it really can just be simple as that. And this is a good example of that. Right. So there are two links. I'm just gonna show you one just to, so you get the idea. And this is created by Empower Change, which is um, a group that's also um, on Shakori's team. And you can see from the graphic We've created a really strong coalition um, that is work, that is fighting for Shakori, and that's one of the things that's really important. And, and any of you on this call can volunteer for probably any of these organizations. But you know, we 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 advocate for NSC. Um, but this is a really incredible tool. It's basically click to email or a click to call. So you all you need to do, um, and um, you know, I've we've shared this in the comments. It's on Facebook, and I don't know how else you're sharing with people. Uh, is that no. you? What's that? That's about it, yeah. Okay. Um, well, we'll put it in again. But you put, fill out your information and literally you click and it does, this, this tool does all the work for you as far as emails go. And there's another one, um, I don't know if you can all see it, but it's also, it's click to call and it, it takes you right uh, to Cuomo's um, line. And you either, it, it might send you through a few different channels to get there, but you'll get there. So it literally does all the work for you. And we really, we're really we really imploring people to do this. Like, like Andreas and Deirdre said, we want Shakori home with his family for the holidays, not in ICE detention or ICE jail. Um, and the other thing, you know, again, as I mentioned, um, you, can, you can sign on to join NSC via our website. That's also in the links. And um, I'm gonna stop the screen share. And we are going to have a, a massive letter writing campaign for Maria, who I mentioned earlier, and we need people, um, we need people for things like that. So they're very simple things that you can do. You can do it for five minutes a day and you will literally have made a difference in a human being's life. Yes. So, thank you so much. Page. And thank you so much. And, and that rem just reminds us that these active um, calls that we've been taking these have been happening throughout history and it's only with the internet that now we, it's this easy. <laughs> but um, I think it's really important to note that uh, we are participating in history. It's not a thing of the past and we can do something. And that's what this panel was aiming to portray. Um, and I really appreciate you all being here. And I thank you to the department, our chair, Autumn Costo, and the uh, Committee on Inclusion and Diversity for our department. And thank you all for joining us. Um, we will, uh, have another panel hopefully next month um, or definitely next month. We just have to schedule it. But uh, so keep your eye out for that date and thank you all for attending. And, and do those action items right now as you, when you hang up. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much for your invitation.